One recent request that came in was all about QoS, quality of service. Quality of service is amazing, it's important, because if we have traffic flowing through our network, how does the network know what part should go first and which part go later if there's congestion? Well, it's important that we configure the network to operate based on a set of rules. Why? So things like video and voice over IP can all go seamlessly. Kevin Wallace, a longtime friend, is an expert on QoS, and I chatted with him a while back, and he said, Keith, I've got a video on QoS, you can just use it. So I'd like to, without further ado, introduce and welcome my very good friend, Mr. Kevin Wallace. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is Kevin Wallace and I want to thank you for the great feedback you gave me from the first video that I put out on five Cisco Iowa shortcuts and I thought as a follow-up video series we might talk about the three most challenging topics when it comes to quality of service. I'm going to be teaching the quality of service class next month and I was thinking about some of the topics that students find particularly challenging. I mean some topics are very straightforward. Here's how you configure low latency queuing. Here's how you configure RTP header compression. But there are a few topics that conceptually seem to be a little more tough for students to get their heads around. So I thought we might do a series of videos addressing these three most challenging QoS topics. And the three that I pick might be different than what you would say, so please let me know. If you have a different topic that you consider to be particularly challenging in the world of quality of service, contact me and let me know what that is. Maybe we can cover that in a future video. And I think quality of service is relevant to so many people in Cisco because whether you're doing route switch or security or voice, quality of service is definitely applicable to you. The first quality of service challenging topic that I've selected is traffic conditioners. What is a traffic conditioner? A traffic conditioner allows us to set a speed limit on different traffic types. Maybe we don't want music downloads to take up more than a certain amount of bandwidth coming into the network. As a service provider, we want to limit the upload and download speeds for our customers based on what they're paying us. And there are two main traffic conditioners, and those are policing and shaping. First, let's consider policing. I consider policing to be more harsh than shaping because policing, by default, is going to drop any traffic that is exceeding, any traffic that is exceeding the speed limit that we spoke of. Policing can be applied in the inbound or outbound directions. Shaping, instead of dropping excess traffic, attempts to delay it. It keeps it in a buffer rather than dropping the excess traffic. And then in a moment when bandwidth demand dies down, shaping can send that traffic out of the router's output queue. Interestingly, shaping can only be applied in the outbound direction, not in the inbound direction. Those are the basic traffic conditioners we have to work with. And what we wanted to cover in this video is the theory of how does this work? People have a tough time conceptualizing oftentimes how we can give some commands in Cisco IOS and suddenly reduce the rate of our traffic. It's as if we give some magic commands and if we had one of those police radar guns that could measure the speed of packets coming out of the interface that they would magically slow down. That's not going to happen guys. That's physically not possible because bits are being clocked out on the wire based on the CSU DSU that's connected to the router. We have to send at line rate. There is no other option. So how do we send at a rate that is less than the line rate? How do we throttle things down? That's what we're going to talk about. Here's the overriding formula. The CIR, the committed information rate, equals the B sub C divided by the T sub C. Now let's talk about these different variables. The CIR, the committed information rate, this is the average, and I emphasize the average speed over the period of a second. If your CIR is 64,000 bits per second, and your line speed were maybe double that, 128,000 bits per second, we're going to show you graphically here in just a moment how we can send at less than the line rate. We can send at half the rate, for example. How is that possible? Well, Cisco uses the metaphor of a token bucket. You see, when a router is making its decision as to whether or not it can send a packet, it takes a look at how many tokens it has in this metaphorical token bucket inside of the router. And if it has enough tokens to send the packet, it will. That's where our other variables come in. The B sub C, that's the committed burst. The committed burst is the number of tokens that we're going to be depositing in the token bucket every timing interval. The units of measure differ a bit with shaping the B sub C unit of measure is bits and for policing the unit of measure is bytes. 
but the concept is the same. We're going to be dumping in, we're going to back up the dump truck and we're going to dump in a certain number of bits or bytes into the token bucket every timing interval. And once those tokens, those bits or bytes have been exhausted, we've sent all the data that could be supported by that number of bits or bytes, we're not able to send anymore until we get more tokens. When's that going to be? Well, we're going to get more tokens every timing interval. That's the T sub C. This is how everything interrelates. Let's take a look at this graphically now. Let's say that we have a line speed of 128 kilobits per second, but our CIR is only 64,000 bits per second. How do we send at a rate that is less than the line rate? Well, let's check it out. When we start to send, we said we have to send at the line rate, so we start to send at a rate of 128,000 bits per second. But suddenly, before that first timing interval elapses, we're out of tokens. And by the way, the graphic I've drawn on screen is the default behavior for frame relay traffic shaping. That was an easy one to draw. The frame relay traffic shaping takes a one second period of time and divides it into eight time slots. So that's what we have. We have eight different timing intervals on screen. And during the first timing interval, we have just sent our B sub C bits, 8,000 bits, and our bucket is empty. What does that mean? That means our speed drops to zero we're sending at a rate of zero kilobits per second until that first timing interval rolls around. Then we back up the dump truck and we dump in B sub C bits. Because we're talking about shaping its bits and not bytes, we're going to dump in B sub C bits and suddenly we can send again. We're going to send at the line rate. We have to send at the line rate. There's no way to slow down, remember. And when we're sending at the line rate, we're going to again empty our bucket out and we're going to send nothing until the next timing interval comes around. And then the same thing is going to happen in the next timing interval. And I didn't draw all these out. I think you get the pattern. What we're doing is in every timing interval we're sending 8,000 bits. Notice the formula. I wrote it a bit differently here. Here the T sub C I said equals the B sub C divided by the CIR. In other words, the timing interval for frame relay traffic shaping, that's a known quantity. By default it's 1 eighth of a second. It's 125 milliseconds. We know the CIR that we want is 64,000 bits per second, so we just plug and chug to figure out what the B sub C is, and it's 8,000 bits per second. And what we're doing, we're sending 8,000 bits per second eight times. Do you see how this is working out now? We sent 8,000 bits eight times, so over the period of a second, on average, we sent 64,000 bits per second. That's how we can send at less than the line rate. And as a metaphor to help you remember this, let's imagine that you're going to go visit one of your friends today and they live 60 miles away from you. And you're in a hurry to get there, so you're going to get on the highway and you're going to drive at 120 miles an hour. This is just an illustration, guys. I'm not suggesting this. But let's say you're going to drive at 120 miles an hour. And the speed limit happens to be 60 miles per hour. And let's say that on the way to your friend's house, a law enforcement official pulls you over and they say, do you realize you were driving at 120 miles an hour? You could arguably say that, well, actually, I was just driving 60 miles per hour. You see, over the period of an hour, you would have only driven 60 miles. You would have driven at a rate of 120 miles an hour for 30 minutes, and you would be stopped. You'd be in your friend's driveway for the next 30 minutes, and your speed then would be zero. So over the period of an hour, on average, you were driving at a rate of 60 miles per hour. Okay, that's not going to work on the highway probably, but that is the way it works with policing and shaping. In fact, there's one other variable we haven't mentioned yet, and that's B sub E, the excess burst rate. Let's say that in future timing intervals, like I've sketched out here on screen, in future timing intervals, we don't have that much traffic to send. If we have a bigger token bucket, a token bucket that can hold more than 8,000 bits, we can send above and beyond B sub C bits or bytes in a timing interval. That's going to allow us to temporarily burst above the CIR. So you can see on screen that during our fourth timing interval, maybe we only sent a couple thousand bits. We had a remainder of 6,000 bits in the bucket. And during the fifth timing interval, we didn't send anything. So we had another 8,000 bits dumped on top of our 6,000 bits. And then in the sixth timing interval, we got another 8,000 bits for a grand total of 22,000 bits. So now we can send at line rate for quite some time. We can send 22,000 bits at line rate. And when we hit the next timing interval, we're going to get a fresh supply of 8,000 bits. So if we save up our bits and we don't send them, and if we have the B sub E value set, we could burst above the CIR value for a period of time. 
Okay, guys, that was the first of three QoS trouble spots that I've identified. Hope you enjoyed it. Please leave me your comments, and we'll see you back in a few days for number two on the list.